fundamental grams BID for 10 months with the subsequent plan for RT. The reason it's 10 months to start was that he had a rather large prostate and they wanted to shrink it down so that uh, he'd have less issues with concern about instruction, uh, with obstruction. So he's minding his own business, he's walking down the street and he falls and sustains the following which is a new right femoral neck fracture. He's now had no histories of fractures, tries to go to the gym, but he's a lawyer. He sits a fair amount of time and uh, has actually been going part-time trying to slowly retire. Our question really is how do we prevent further bone-related events? Now, what you can certainly appreciate, uh, he has a little bit of scoliosis. This is the uh, bladder, so the contrast agent is in the bladder. It's a little spillage of urine on the gown. These are not metastatic foci at all. This is just some DJD. But you'll notice that the femoral head is one place and the neck is in the other place. So that's quite a, a dramatic uh, fracture. So really, in assessing bone health, particularly in patients, uh, we've been, I would say, negligent in terms of doing the pre treatment assessment as opposed to the post-treatment assessment. So what I'd like to do today is try to review, and again, I'm open to suggestions in terms of really what are the best imaging techniques to really assess baseline and interim uh, follow-up in patients uh, who may be sustaining bone loss or may be at high risk for fracture. The question is also how fast do these changes occur? How, when do we really need to put the, the, you know, the, the, the glasses on to make sure that we're not missing anything that could contribute to worsening comorbidities of the patient? And largely, how do we prevent the fracture? So I wouldn't be the first one to tell my colleagues here that osteoporosis is very often undiagnosed in men. I guess many of us would say that men are always viewed as being very active. Women are very proactive, but that's not really been my experience with the male population. We know that osteoporosis will affect roughly, I don't know, anywhere from 10 to 25% of men who are over the age of 60. There are contributory risk factors of which we all know and share in our patients, and they are including but not limited to alcohol use, cigarette smoking, sedentary existence, you know, recurrent falls or fractures, maybe a significant family history of osteoporosis. Actually, one of my colleagues in the dermatology department has been fracturing bone after bone after bone and shared with me that her mother and several of the relatives had very severe osteoporosis. So here's this poor you know, physician. Every time I walk in to see her, she has a cast in one part of her body or another. So this is something that one really has to take very seriously. You know, is there a problem with decreasing executive function? Is somebody who's suddenly been very active becoming inactive because worsening aches and pains only to find out that they may have sustained a compression fracture? Patients who have prostate cancer, albeit untreated, not having seen hormones, not having any metastatic disease, if you evaluate the literature, about 40% of them have osteopenia and about 11% actually have osteoporosis as per the, uh, the actual guidelines. There is a uh, recent meta-analysis that indicated that osteoporosis was seen in anywhere from four to maybe 40% of patients who were hormone naive and that the prevalence was actually higher in those who had metastatic disease. So interestingly, hormonal uh, therapy can actually institute loss of bone mineral density as early as six to nine months after the initiation of androgen deprivation. In fact, some people would argue it's as early as even three months and therefore you have a higher risk. And within five years of starting androgen deprivation therapy, we have been seeing osteoporotic skeletal fractures in almost up to 20 and maybe even now 25% of men. Now, we're dealing with a very bone trophic disease, as you can imagine, a bone is the most common site of metastasis in prostate cancer. And if you go back and look at an autopsy study, about close to 1,600 men who had prostate cancer, 90% or greater actually had bone involvement. And while fracture, you know, while there's a certain percentage of men with prostate cancer who have treatment-related bone loss, the pathologic fracture can actually go up to about as high as 50%, uh, more than really is expected.
Interestingly, roughly 14, 15% of all fractures were deemed to be pathologic. 2% of the fractures among adults in the general population were actually due to a very specific lesion at a specific site within the vertebrae. And it was certainly much greater in men who were undergoing androgen deprivation therapy. Therefore, there is an unmet need for these patients and that we really should be looking for the onset or pre-existence of osteoporosis and osteopenia well before initiating androgen deprivation therapy, particularly in the older population. Uh, the issue is, you know, what are they doing? How can we fix lifestyle changes? And uh, maybe by avoiding or trying to avoid alcohol or smoking or increasing dietary calcium, we could make, I guess, modest changes in lifestyle, but it's just not enough for the most part. Dr. Faruqi was kind enough to uh, allow me to use these next two slides. And I think it's very important because it gives you a very interesting perspective. So this is bone loss, the percentage of patients with bone loss at uh, one year. This is really normal men. And if you look at the green, obviously, is naturally occurring bone loss, which is rather slow over the course of time. But it's highly accelerated in, in patients who are on a variety of different cancer therapies. I'm going to zoom in to my friend here at the prostate. You certainly can see that it's, it's certainly higher than the normal population. Uh, women who are on aromatase inhibitors in the postmenopausal setting certainly much more increased. And then if you go for the changes that women may have with menopause or other agents, you can see it really goes uh, quite through the roof. We know that bone density is a major determinant of fracture risk, and therefore the more negative the T-score, the more aggravated and the more uh, concerned we need to be. And as you can see here, that the nature of that fragility fracture is really what helps us trying to determine whether or not that really is the clinical diagnosis of uh, osteoporosis. So if you go from this end here and go to low bone mass where you have osteopenia, it's, uh, it's almost a no-brainer that you're going to end up with osteoporosis. So if you look at the current methodologies, we all have been taught about DEXA scans. It's been uh, accepted by the World Health Organization as their reference standard for the diagnosis of osteoporosis. But ironically, it really has a very low sensitivity for the prediction of fractures. And therefore, there have been multiple attempts to look at quantitative CT, quantitative ultrasound, MRI, uh, they're, they've all been used. And while they may provide some insight into bone strength and the actual architecture, they are really not considered standards. They still are considered research and therefore you can't use them for the diagnosis based on what the WHO criteria are. Uh, a lot of people use the FRAC score. It's been approved both by the FDA and the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, or NICE, in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom also has the Q fracture, and that's also an accepted uh, uh, algorithm, if you will. Uh, it's based on their own prospected open cohort of about 2 million patients, and so it's well validated. And they all incorporate bone mineral density measurements along with specific variables, and they are, will allow you to calculate the 10-year probability of a major osteoporotic fracture and or hip fracture. I am guilty of not using this consistently. And this is a problem that while we as medical oncologists and even urologists use bisphosphonates, somehow, some way, we, uh, when we, by the time we see patients who may already have metastatic disease, I guess we very often go on the assumption that the primary care physician or the endocrinologist or some patient uh, healthcare uh, professionals have already been involved in dealing with this, and that's really the wrong thing for us to assess. Androgen deprivation therapy, as all of you know, uh, will result in the